Welcome to another Pearson Centre webinar on the theme of COVID and beyond. My name is Francesca Iacorto and I'm an advisory board member of the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs of the National Airlines Council of Canada. As many of you will know, the Pearson Centre is a progressive think tank that addresses the big economic and social challenges of the day. In that context, I am pleased to welcome you to the 16th webinar on major policy issues related to COVID-19 and how they are affecting our society. Our ongoing project is called COVID and Beyond, recognizing that we have a lot of issues to address in this era of COVID-19 and that the recovery and rebuilding will be slow and long and will also be an important time to reimagine re Canada. However, before we get into today's program, I to want to tell you that our upcoming webinars will include guests such as Innovation Minister Nafi Baines, and will cover issues including the manufacturing sector, climate change, the future of work and technology, and national childcare. Please visit our website for more information at the Pearson Centre, all in one word, .ca. I also want to take a moment to thank our, our sponsors who make these events possible. The event sponsor for today is Aurora Strategy Group, while our two sustaining sponsors are, first, Canada's Building Trades Unions, and second, the International Association of Firefighters. So a big thank you to, three or, to those three organizations. While these webinars are free to attend, please feel free to visit our website, again, at the Pearson Center, all in one word, .ca, and make a contribution. Now back to the panel. Today, we will talk about immigration, COVID-19, and economic recovery. Our keynote guest is the Honourable Marco Mendocino, who is the Minister for Parliament for Eglinton Lawrence, and also the Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. He's a lawyer by profession and was first elected in 2015. He will be joined by a stellar panel. First, we will have Indira Naidu Harris, who is currently Assistant VP Human Rights and Equity at the University of Guelph. Prior to that, she served as an MPP and Cabinet Minister in Ontario. We also have with us Denise Amio, who is currently the President and CEO of Colleges Institutes Canada, CICAN, and prior to that was a senior public servant <laughs> in the federal government. Last but by no means least, we have with us Amir Kasim Laka, who is a developer and entrepreneur and serves as the president of the Ismaili Council of Canada. And I am pleased to tell you that our moderator today will be Andrew Cardozo, who is the president of the Pearson Centre and also writes a regular column for the Hill Times. With respect to the format, the discussion will last about 40 minutes and then be followed by a Q&A period with you, the audience, before we end promptly at noon Eastern time. Please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Pearson YouTube channel later on this afternoon. Just go to YouTube and search for Pearson Centre. It will also be available via podcast in a few days. So with uh, on that note, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Francesca, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, Mel uh, welcome, Minister Mendicino. Welcome back to the Pearson podium. It's nice to have you back. Um, we will. I, I've got a few questions for you, after which we'll bring in our, our panel as well. But before we start, let me ask you if you have uh, some opening thoughts. Well, uh, bonjour tout le monde, and thank you very much, Andrew, for that very kind and suspiciously brief introduction, which uh, tells me that we are going to put a premium on the uh, substance of this morning's discussion. It's, it's a real delight for me to be back uh, with you and uh, the rest of our esteemed panel uh, at Pearson. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion around uh, COVID and immigration, where we are and where we are going. I will say, this has been an unprecedented period. I know there's been a lot of change, but at least in my hometown, one thing that hasn't changed is the Toronto Maple Leafs exiting early out of the playoffs. And so uh, my heart uh, goes out to the team and as always, uh, hope springs eternal. C'est un plaisir d'être avec vous ce matin. Je suis heureux d'être ici pour uh, discuter le, de la politique d'immigration du Canada et pour avoir un échange d'idées sur la façon dont nous réagissons de, au COVID-19. As you well know, COVID-19 has had a profound impact across government and indeed across every facet of life. My department, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, 
has not been spared from this impact. We've had to shift, readjust, adapt, and innovate in ways that we never would have imagined. In fact, when I received my mandate letter from the Prime Minister last November, there was nothing in there about having to restrict border travel or having to consult the Minister of Health and other cabinet colleagues on disallowing my hometown Blue Jays from playing at home. Uh, 2020 has been and continues to be indeed a whole new ball game with new rules, new procedures, and here we are. The pandemic and resulting shutdown immediately affected almost every part of IRCC's business operations from application processing to settlement services to citizenship and passport services. And I wanna take a moment to thank and commend the department as they have been impelled to adapt and innovate and very quickly to ensure that we can still deliver on our core priorities. While we're still not out of the pre-COVID pace, we're back up to it, we have found solutions to problems we never thought would exist. We've adapted and we've innovated and we've been successful in many areas and let me give you a few examples. Since mid-April, more than 24,000 people have received their permanent resident confirmation virtually. We implemented exemptions for travel restrictions, which would allow migrant workers to enter Canada safely so that farms and food processing facilities could continue to operate. And even more importantly, Canadians would continue to gain access to safe and affordable food. Recognizing the nature of work in the agriculture sector is inherently laborious and challenging. We've introduced over $100 million in funding and supports to protect the rights of migrant workers and of course, to aid our farmers. We continue to work assiduously with our provincial and territorial partners, as well as with the educational sector, to look for ways to build on the success of the International Student Program, which contributes over $21 billion to our economy annually. Already in Canada, we know that there will be students uh, who are beginning to study online, as well as those students who are abroad still. We've adapted our programs to the cha changing COVID environment to ensure Canada remains a top destination for students from around the world. No one ever thought of doing citizenship ceremonies virtually, and now we've held almost a thousand of them. Uh, my favorite to date was on July 1st in Canada Day, where we had new citizens sworn into the family of Canadian citizenship right across the country. And I maintain that this is one of the most special and unique functions that I get to exercise as the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. There is really no substitute, no way to articulate that special moment uh, when you look a new citizen in the eye after all of the challenge and the journey and all of the, uh, the, the great uh, adversity overcome to make it to that important milestone. Urgent work has also continued to resettle refugees from abroad. Since the travel restrictions went into effect in March of 2020, Canada has welcomed nearly 700 refugees, all of whom required urgent protection. We've also found certain ways to ensure loved ones could be together during this unprecedented time by permitting immediate family members who are related to Canadian citizens and permanent residents to be exempt from COVID-19 travel restrictions. These are just some of the highlights of what we've already accomplished, but there's obviously much more work to do. Looking ahead, we're assessing when and how borders can reopen, what immigration will look like in both the short term as well as the long term. There's no doubt, just as there was no doubt immediately after previous global crises and wars, that immigration to Canada will play a vital role in rebuilding and strengthening our economy. Immigration has shaped our country since before Confederation. It has made us a strong global leader economically and socially, and that principle is not going to change. While immigration to Canada has been impacted in the short term, the long-term drivers for responsible increases to immigration levels remain. This fall, I will be providing an update on immigration to Parliament. There are a number of key priorities that we are going to be looking at very closely. Do we have the right levels when it comes to economic, family, and humanitarian immigration? How can we build on existing pilots to further incent regional immigration? How can we strengthen our partnership with the provinces through their allocations? And how do municipalities increasingly fit into the overall framework for immigration in Canada? How do we accelerate integration, not only into the economy, but into our communities? And how do we maintain the public's confidence that immigration remains an economic driver and a positive socially cohesive force at a time when we are facing a once in a century pandemic? Canada will have labor shortages in key economic sectors and we will need skilled immigrants and refugees to help fill these jobs to make our economy grow. We will continue to welcome students to Canadian educational institutions 
some of which are the finest in the world, and we will search for and attract the best global talent available. Immigration will strengthen our post-COVID economic recovery in the short term with the lifelines to food, to health supplies, to energy, as I've already described. But I know it will also continue to contribute to our economy and communities in the long term, as it always has. And this is why I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. I want to hear from employers and from the educational sector, from big, medium, and small businesses, from coast to coast to coast. We're all here to make this country better. And so together, let's talk about how we can ensure that our immigration policies support the recovery and the relaunch and the growth of the economy for all Canadians in all regions. Once again, thank you, Andrea, Andrew, and everybody at Pearson for this uh, very special opportunity to have the discussion this morning. It's an honor to be here. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, your, your introduction covered a lot of uh, important and interesting territory. Let me start with, with the issue of the day, healthcare. Uh, when I look at the at the healthcare system across the country, um, I, I wonder if the backbone of the healthcare system is immigrants. Uh, whether you think of doctors, whether you think of nurses, whether you think of personal support workers, there is just a wide range of people who've come from all over the world. And um, you know, if if you visit a doctor's building, if you visit a senior's home, if all those immigrants were not there, we'd have a much a less able healthcare system. Is that a fair assessment? Well, I, I think it is, and it allows me to open up this uh, question and answer period by talking about how the histories of immigration, the, the history and the lessons of immigration have always been that it pays off for Canada in attracting the best and the brightest. And yes, indeed, in the health sector, uh, many professionals come from abroad to become credentialed, to apply their trades. And that is especially true right now when we know that the front lines of our healthcare systems have been at the ready to respond to the initial uh, outbreaks and spikes. And now, thankfully, we're seeing uh, the cases move in that downward trajectory in large part because of the uh, high caliber of our healthcare professionals, many of whom are part of the immigrant narrative. And so we want to continue to attract uh, healthcare professionals and indeed professionals and skilled workers from all over the world. And this also allows me to take a moment to talk about the international student program where we have created some flexibility to allow those who are currently taking uh, degrees in healthcare, whether it's as a doctor, as a nurse, or indeed uh, as a support care worker who are so fundamentally and essentially important to providing the support, the treatment that is necessary to those who've been afflicted with COVID-19. And we've seen uh, some of the tragedies unfold, for example, in our retirement homes. Um, immigration is, is allowing us to take a whole of government response so we can bring all hands on deck to marshal that response that is necessary, that has put Canada, I think, in a very, very good position. And going forward, uh, my hope is that the policies that we put into place will allow us to contribute in the same productive way. Um, one of the areas that, had, that continues to be a, a challenge is the migrant workers um, it, who are essential to farming as well. Um, I shouldn't say they're the challenge, but their housing is the challenge. And indeed, they, they're brought in and often housed in situations which turns out to be rather unhealthy in this in this uh, um, in in this situation. What what can we be doing about that? Well, first, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, the very tragic loss of three migrant workers who were here who passed away because of COVID. And I've expressed this, and other colleagues have expressed uh, our, our our profound sympathies to those families. And also to acknowledge that the migrant workers who are working in the agricultural sector are contributing in such an important way to maintain food security for all Canadians. And this is why, at the very outset, not only did we create an exemption to the border restrictions to allow that cohort of, of migrant workers to come who've established uh, you know, deep connections within their communities here in Canada, but we've also provided uh, important and significant support. Uh, initially, $50 million, $1,500 per worker to address the accommodations issues, which you uh, outlined in your question. And within the last week and a half, an additional $57 uh, to further ensure that uh, farmers are able to tap into that support to make sure that the lodging and accommodations are safe, as well as the work conditions themselves, which we have to, uh, again, 
uh, appreciate that uh, are inherently and intrinsically uh, risky given the nature of the work itself. So uh, over 107 or $108 million contributed directly to the migrant worker community. I know that both me and my colleague, uh, Minister Qualtro, have directly engaged with a number of the advocacy groups who have uh, who have put forward a series of recommendations around ensuring that there is a, a set of uh, standards in place to protect the rights of workers. Uh, we are continuing to uh, move forward with a robust inspections regime. Uh, we want to be sure uh, that, uh, that, that employers and farmers are being held up to that high standard that not only migrant workers, but every worker in Canada uh, should be entitled to, uh, to expect. Uh, because that's the reputation that uh, that we have as a country. So we've made good progress. We know that this is a challenging sector and there's more work to do. And we continue to be engaged with migrant workers as well as the advocacy organizations who represent them. Yeah, and, and is, this, uh, is there a provincial role as well there or is this primarily uh, a federal role in terms of fixing the problem? Without question, and we have been uh, very engaged with our provincial partners as well as the, as the employers themselves. In fact, the occupational health and safety standards are uh, under the purview of the provincial uh, government. And so I'm proud to say that uh, on this file that I have had very uh, collaborative and constructive uh, relationships with all of my PT counterparts, uh, and in particular, the big provinces where there are a high number of migrant workers in Ontario and BC and in Quebec and uh, in the Maritimes as well. And we are uh, leveraging those relationships to ensure that we are on the outbreaks. And we know that there have been challenges and it is with the cooperation of the provinces that we've been able to turn things around. As I say, progress that has been made, uh, but still a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, the Temporary Foreign Worker Program is an important part of our overall immigration uh, framework. Um, it has proven to be a lifeline uh, for Canada throughout the pandemic and is going to continue to be one as we move into the fall season, as we move into harvesting and making sure that we're working with our source countries as well, uh, you know, where, where we want to be sure that there is a smooth flow across the border and most importantly that the workers are safe and that they're working in a safe and healthy environment. And and what's the situation with uh, with um, professional sports? You've you've said no to to baseball, no to the Blue Jays. I'm guessing you had to hide from your friends and neighbors for a few days after that. Um, what's the what's the situation with the other sports? Yeah, I have, I've often joked that my 14 year old self really uh, hates me for making the decision, but on the flip side, uh, it was the right call. Um, we uh, consulted very heavily, both with uh, uh, Major League Baseball, as well as the city and the province. And uh, we took uh, it, our advice from the Public Health Agency of Canada, who looked very closely at the plan that was put forward by Major League Baseball, and who assessed that there were still significant risks, given that the, made, that the regular season contemplated a lot of back and forth travel uh, across the border. And uh, right now, just given the state of affairs, uh, we felt that uh, the only uh, call that we could make in the circumstances was to say no. Now, we continue to be engaged with um, uh, Major League Baseball as well as the Toronto Blue Jays uh, franchise. And the good news is that if you're a fan, you can still watch uh, the Jays play. And if I'm not mistaken, they're now playing in Buffalo, New York, which isn't too far. And so you can still get uh, the best of both worlds. Uh, as you know, we're working with other professional sports, um, including the NHL. Uh, there's a, a very different model that was put into place where there was uh, two hub cities, uh, all teams uh, essentially quarantined in a very uh, circumscribed uh, perimeter and uh, no cross-border travel, no international cross-border travel. And so that was one of the main distinctions uh, between the two uh, approaches and one of the reasons why uh, we felt that we could uh, manage the risks with that particular sport. And so far, uh, I think the reports have come back that no one has tested positive, which tells us that uh, the league there is working uh, with a very rigorous uh, testing and tracing regime. And we continue to work with other professional sports uh, but look, Andrew, I mean, professional sports is an important part, but I think that there are many other sectors when you take a step back that we've got to be looking at very carefully. And I come back to international students, and I know that Denise, who's on the panel, is one of a number of leaders that we've been working with. And as I said to uh, the colleges and the universities, you know, when it comes to international students, of course, we recognize the significant uh, economic contributions, the contributions of uh, students when it comes to our social fabric, but we also have to manage the risks that are associated with welcoming back 
uh, international students and new students into communities because these are, uh, in many instances, students who've never been to Canada before, so they need that support. And we also need to be sure that those institutions which have the designation from provinces uh, are able to put in place the plan that is necessary. And that's work that is going on in earnest. And I see Denise is smiling because her and I have had many, many constructive conversations about this and we will continue to do that work together. Tous ensemble. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, it, it strikes me as interesting the way you as minister and your department uh, have really a good working relationship with the universities and colleges as well as the immigrant serving organizations and the advocacy groups across the country. And that's really a, a history where government and community work together very well. So congratulations on, on keeping that moving. I have one more question I want to ask before I get the other panelists involved and, and sort of take us to a broader picture of, um, of immigration going forward. There is an argument that's put forward by some that at this point we should be shutting down immigration, that we should not be bringing any immigrants in. Um, we need to get our house in order in this crisis. Um, it, going forward, what is your, what's your argument for continuing immigration and going back to the levels that we've had? How does that help economic recovery? I have to say, I subscribe to a very different school of thought, a one that sees that immigration is an economic driver, that with new immigration, we see better jobs growth. And when you look back over the course of our history, you see a positive correlation between uh, immigration growth uh, that is informed by uh, very healthy consultations with uh, businesses and with the public sector, as well as the Canadian public and net GDP growth. And that is going to be one of the main anchors in which we are going to continue to make the case uh, that, that immigration will be uh, not only a, a short-term economic driver to accelerate our recovery out of the pandemic, but to address some of the long-term growth, which is fundamentally necessary when you take a look at the demographic challenges which our country is facing. And uh, those who study this issue very carefully will tell you that our labor force right now is virtually at zero new net growth, which is to say, we need immigration. If we don't uh, enc encourage uh, more immigration, uh, our workforce will continue to age, which will put a greater stress and pressure on those who remain in the workforce to bear the burden of maintaining the uh, long-term health covenants, educational covenants and retirement security covenants, which define uh, this country as one that recognizes that we all uh, you know, are here to distinguish ourselves with work ethic and with entrepreneurialism and with uh, a, a contribution, uh, but also that we give back. And that is what distinguishes Canada. Uh, what distinguishes Canada, I think, from so many uh, other countries, even like-minded countries, is that we are that open country. We are an inclusive country that believes in immigration. And that is a case that I am excited to uh, continue to take uh, to, uh, to the public. And as you heard uh, in my opening remarks, Andrew, uh, we're going to be shaping that discussion around some of the key themes. Do we have the right mix when it comes to economic, family, and humanitarian uh, levels? Do we uh, have to find ways to continue to accelerate regional immigration? Because we know that people will, uh, you know, traditionally pour into the big cities like Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal, but go out to Atlantic Canada and, and talk to folks, uh, you know, in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and Labrador, and they will tell you they are craving for immigration. Our Atlantic immigration pilot is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an unqualified success because it has been driven from the grassroots, from local business owners, from provincial partners, and I'm excited about taking that case to the public, and I'm, that's why uh, I'm so excited, clearly, as you can tell, uh, to be with you this morning. Well, it's it's fun to be talking to an immigration minister who is so uh, excited and enthusiastic about the about the portfolio and the work you do. Um, I, I want to br bring in our panel and, and start with you, Indira and Idu Harris, and ask you the, the the question I just asked the minister in terms of the economic uh, benefits of immigration. And I just want to read out five names to you uh, before we do that. Dr. Teresa Tam. Dr. Howard New, Dr. Saqib Shahab, Dr. Wajid Ahmed, and Dr. Eileen Davila. These are, as you probably will recognize, uh, chief public health officers federally, provincially, and locally across the country. Um, they're really products of immigration and products of, 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 good, um, uh, of a great public health care system. 
uh, that allows people to rise in this in this way and contribute at the highest levels at this time of crisis. So uh, over to you, uh, Indira, either in terms of, 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 of medicine or other areas of the economy, what, what are your thoughts about the benefits that, that immigration brings to Canada? Well, thank you, Andrew, for having me on the show, and also um, Minister Mendicino. It was so good to hear some of your thoughts and, and really encouraging. You know, COVID has hit families in a very hard way. It has been brutal and has been painful for many individuals in our country. And so many of them actually were dealing with the loss of loved ones, the loss of jobs, the loss of their lives, essentially, and, and really, in many ways, the loss of hope. And I think now that rebuilding is more important perhaps than ever before. And we have to essentially recognize that our people are our resources. And I, I am so encouraged and pleased that it was clear to me from the start that our government recognized that. They started investing in people right off the bat to ensure that we were keeping our people, our families and our communities strong in order to be able to get through this difficult time and build for the future. You know, when you talked about those names, one of the first things I thought about was they're almost household names now. You know, there was a time when we wouldn't have known those names if you mentioned them, and then here we are. But the bottom line is this. This is a country that other than our indigenous communities was built on immigration and immigrants coming to this land and working hard. And so it is part and parcel with uh, the fabric of our country and who we are as a society and, and as a nation. And so it is absolutely going to be key in terms of building a stronger future for all of us. Immigrants play um, a, such an important role in our society. And you touched on this a bit, Andrew, when you use the word backbone, I would say, you know, whether they're working, whether they're the newcomers who are already here, so our essential workers, you know, those people who are on the front lines and are in our stores and then our care providers, who are really going to have to be able to deliver properly to give us that foundation uh, in terms of our economy. Then there are those who are already here, like the minister said, you know, essentially the cream of the crop, whose skills to some extent have been underutilized. And we have to activate those people's skills and training right now in order to be able to get this economy going and jump started. So it's all hands on deck. And finally, uh, yeah, the, the shortages that are coming, uh, you know, either because of aging populations, because of low birth rates that have been expected for years, we know it's coming. We're going to have to get out there and make sure that we're bringing in those individuals with the skills, with the experience, and with the know-how that we need to be able to get the job done and to, to really build our country in the way it needs to be built. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that uh, this is a competitive world right now. Everybody is scrambling and everybody is thinking about economic recovery. Canada is in a good place because, as you pointed out, because of our health care system. We are in a unique position and it is an important moment in time for us as a country to recognize that this is now the time for us to jump forward. And part of that is recognizing the roles of our resources, our people, and the important role that immigrants and newcomers play in this country and will be playing for years to come in terms of building us up and creating that foundation that we need to be able to make sure that our children and our future is intact. Thank you, Indira. Uh, Amir Kasim Lakha, let me ask you, um, you're a, a businessman yourself and you're a leader in the Ismaili community. A lot of the people from your community came to Canada as, as refugees in the 70s. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how the community has um, integrated and been essentially very successful? I think uh, there, there's been kind of two uh, kind of sets of supports that the community has provided to immigrants. You know, everybody who comes to Canada views Canada as a country of opportunity be it a professional, be it uh, a, a migrant worker, uh, or, or be it an entrepreneur. And I think that, uh, you know, the approach that the community has taken uh, on two fronts is, first of all, to support entrepreneurs. And that, that initial year after, uh, you know, someone immigrates to Canada is absolutely critical in terms of goal setting and establishing a vision for where they want to go. 
uh, with, 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 with business and with, with their growth opportunities in Canada. So some of the things that, that we have done as a community uh, in, in kind of the 50 years that the Smiley community has been uh, immigrating to Canada since the uh, early 70s and the, the Ugandan crisis, which precipitated the migration to Canada, is that the moment uh, you know uh, someone arrives in the country, there are immediate supports provided in terms of uh, you know first of all vocational counseling, business advisory services, uh, mentorship programs, connecting with people who have experience in a particular industry, but at the same time also facilitating access to credit and uh, and uh, and uh, facilitating access to venture capital funds that can be uh, made available in order to support their, their entry into business. And so that trajectory uh, it is, is foundational in the first year. And kind of mobilizing all these support resources is, is really critical to, to enable uh, success from a business perspective. I think from the point of view of, uh, of the professionals and, uh, and others who come in under the employment programs, kind of similar uh, uh, you know, counseling services that the community provides kind of helps people find their way. People who come here, a lot of them have that, that spirit, that agency, but facilitating it and unlocking it in that first year or two is absolutely critical. The other kind of uh, key uh, foundational, uh, you know, pillar, if you will, to success is, is ensuring that in the first year, people really ramp up with their language skills because that is a key barrier to, to, to progression. So you, we kind of work on all three fronts, supporting entrepreneurs, uh, supporting people in terms of, uh, you know, how to look at vocational uh, training where it's available and making those connections, facilitating access. The kind of current and most, uh, you know, uh, topical uh, issue within the community right now is transitioning uh, the community and particularly those who are new in the country to, to you know, future of work type of thinking. You know, it's, it's important that uh, everybody, uh, not only Canadians who've been uh, here for, for a decade or two or three or four or five, but you know, even those who have come to Canada more recently, that they should really have a vision in terms of you know, what, the, what the growth opportunities in the future are. And, and that means you know, uh, identifying those opportunities is not clear to everyone that you know, what, what are the growth areas and what are the areas that people should be considering. People need conversation around uh, you know, how to look at things and, and to come to, to terms and accept that there are certain things that people have been doing pre-COVID they're not going to continue to be able to do. Accepting that reality and then looking at the opportunities that are on the table and, and connecting uh, with education institutions that can help pivot help people pivot into growth opportunities. It requires a lot of hand-holding, a lot of, again, mentorship, counseling. So those are the services that we're really gearing up to provide to, to community members to be able to really pivot into the future. And it's, it's not just about the careers and jobs, it's also about businesses. Because, you know, small businesses are the engine of the economy and, uh, you know, been a key driver, immigrants have played a very significant role in, in the small business area. And, and, and we're concerned that many owner operated businesses will be challenged post COVID. And, and uh, so small business owners also need to have a view on what are the entrepreneurial opportunities that will be, you know, uh, uh, that'll, that'll have strong growth prospects in the future and how they should realign themselves. So there's a lot of work that can be done at a community level uh, to, to provide that mentorship, that counseling, that kind of visioning that, that people need support with. Th thank you, Amir. Um, certainly what you've outlined is, is, is the important work that, that you're doing in your community and that happens across the country through immigrant serving agencies, um, a large part of which are funded by the federal government and in some cases provincial governments too. Um, I've had the good fortune of being on a couple of uh, boards of organizations that do that and and they are really one of the most inspiring areas to work in because you've got a lot of people who come there with a lot of hope and agencies which just really uh, fill those needs to a large extent. Um, Denise, let me, uh, Denise Amiro, you're, you head the, the Colleges Association, CICAN. Um, you do some really interesting work, both preparing immigrants before they arrive 
as well as when they get here. Uh, the, before they arrive is really a very interesting approach. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and by the way, Minister, as we're going through, feel free to uh, jump in and add or, or question our, our panelists as you as you see fit. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to just I'm happy to be in listening mode right now. But past okay. it. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew and uh, Minister. I want to thank you publicly for the support you have uh, given to us with respect to international students, your staff and your department, and we are continuing to work uh, diligently uh, with you. Um, so uh, before I answer your question, uh, I want to reflect, Andrew, if I may, on yeah. an article that there was in the Globe and Mail this weekend. Uh, written by John Ibiston and Daryl Breaker uh, about immigration. And I will just quote the sentence because I thought it says it all. The, and this was in the big title, okay? And uh, so I will read it. Embracing newcomers is the only solution to societal aging and economic turmoil. And we know that a number of uh, countries or now limiting their uh, immigration. And in fact, if you read that article, it's the opposite. Uh, it is the only way to economic recovery. So I want to make sure that we, uh, this is clear to the people that participate in this, uh, because there is sometimes uh, it can be misleading if you don't know the, the full the full truth. So coming back to your question, Andrew, with respect to what it is that we do for uh, immigrants pre-arrival. Uh, in fact, the minister uh, talked earlier about how Canada distinguish uh, itself by being an open country, welcoming and peaceful country. But Canada distinguish itself also because of the planning for Canada. Canada is the only country in the world to have such a program where what we do is before immigrants arrive in Canada, they have access to an orientation session. And that orientation session talks about what kind of jobs there is in Canada, where is it that they can go, where is it that there are more opportunities in certain fields. But it also helps them to develop their own personal plan of action. And I'm pleased to report that after six months, uh, those that have taken that program 86% find a job within six months, 86% of new immigrants, because we also do virtual fairs uh, in some specific fields. And uh, if it is in, in their own field, within six months, it's 69%. So this is not uh, something that a lot of people know, but it shows the importance of providing pre-arrival services. So, uh, and of course, with COVID, we adapted our presentations. We moved everything online, of course, but we also included aspects of COVID-19 because immigrants that were arriving, they were curious, they wanted to know, is it safe to go in Canada? How is it? What kind of measures do exist? So we made sure that this was done. And what is interesting, we have noticed a higher than usual attendance and participations from clients that take uh, use of, uh, of the planning for Canada. The second thing that I want to say with respect to uh, immigrants is the importance of the post-secondary education sector because it can help them to integrate. It can help them to upskill or reskill. We do even have a number of colleges that what they do, they put uh, immigrants in a certain field on what we call the fast track so that they don't need to repeat everything that they have done in the past, but only what is specific to Canada so that they can immediately uh, start to work in a faster track if you want. Um, uh, Amir Ali talk about language. We also, of course, do a lot of language training, but what is interesting, we also do in the college system 
specific language training that is linked to some given profession. So it means that it helps those future uh, employees to be familiarized with the language of the, the professions that they already have, yeah. for which they had experience, but that will help them to, to uh, work quicker in their field because they will also be familiar with uh, uh, English or French uh, terminology. Um, there, I cannot not talk about the importance of PLAR, Prior Learning Assessment Recognition. Many immigrants come in Canada and they do not know about prior learning assessment recognition and they think they have to redo everything. I don't know how many times I have heard that when in fact they do not need to redo everything. Colleges are equipped right now to assess the skills of people and help them to transition either to a similar field or to the field that is of interest to them. And so I do encourage people that know about immigrants arriving that may not know about prior learning assessment recognition to do so. Last point, I cannot not talk about international students because first the minister talk about it, but because this is part of our bread and butter, 22 billion, you've heard the number but it's especially because those international students, we already know that 51% of them intend to, in fact, stay in Canada uh, and ask for permanent residency, 51% of those students. And they make our best immigrants because they already have integrated they master the language because they have studied, they know the skills, and Amir Ali talked about networking. They already have a network because they're, during their two or three or four years, they had the chance to not only acclimatize to Canada, but also to develop a, a network. So long answer for a short question, Andrew. Okay, um, I had some other questions that I wanted to go uh, through with you, but we've got a number of uh, um, questions coming in from the audience, so we'll switch to those. And um, thank you for your long, detailed, very interesting answers from now on, top, top, short answers. Um, so quickly, um, uh, uh, on the issue of uh, essential workers, um, how can we change the system where essential workers, such as those in, in, in supermarkets and uh, personal support workers, are paid so low? Any thoughts on that? Um, I'll start with you, uh, Indira. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize that they play a really key role in our economy. And that became so clear, actually, during COVID, right? Because everybody was asked to stay home, but who was out there? It was, you know, it, it was the people who were in our, in our grocery stores and, and working in, in various key industries. And so uh, they were really on the front, front lines and became a very important part of our survival and I would say are an important part of the future. So a recognition of the role that they play and really working to ensure that we value their input and give it the kind of respect that it deserves so that we really are able to, to build that foundation for the future. So I think you know, what we really need as a country in many ways is a cultural change. We need to change the way we look at individuals, the skills they bring, and also how we relate to people from uh, different parts of the world. There's no question that we need to do more when it comes to inclusion, acceptance, and respect. And part and parcel with that are these essential workers. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, I'm cutting everybody off here. Uh, Amir, your, your thoughts about how, how we can better um, uh, respond to the, to the low income workers who are the essential workers. I think it's important that uh, you know we we support them through them also uh, kind of uh, finding and thinking through a trajectory of growth and and uh, you know while they may need to start there because they perhaps lack language skills or whatever it might be and, and that's a starting point but it, but it's important to support them with with vocational training and you know they need the point that you made you know we're 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 now looking at this question very carefully 
of how do we how do we uh, add to credentialing uh, of, of immigrants before they arrive and, and not just the orientation programs but but you know connecting with colleges here so that they can actually take online courses that prepare them better and so that they're more productive in the economies of Canada. So I think you know it's it's a great starting point, and Indira has has made the point that you know uh, we we need to as as a society have a cultural change and compensate uh, compensate for the for the type of contributions that they're making. But we also need to invest in their futures because they can make a much deeper contribution to Canada in the long run. Thanks, thanks, Amir. Denise, your quick thought. Quick thought, upskilling, reskilling. Uh, our colleges offer a variety of either micro-credentials or short-term program. Uh, and now with online, it's often offered 24 seven. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to upskill and to ensure that they will follow their passion. Okay, Minister, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all the points made around uh, retooling and, and upskilling. And I will say that there are far more Canadians today who do not take for granted our uh, food support workers, the folks that work at grocery stores, the folks who work on the farms. And that's one of the reasons why the government has put into uh, the system uh, significant investments to support those workers, both in their workplace environments their accommodations where uh, they're migrant workers, and as well some wage supports, and uh, we will continue to support them that way. Okay, I think uh, you, you won't be surprised all that, that a number of the questions coming in are for one person here. Um, that's you, Minister. So, I thought so, they were for you, Andrew. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it a shot, but you, you might not want me to answer them. So, okay. But, but feel free for, for the others to, to, to chime in. Um, so, how can you make the process of assessing applications for immigration more expeditious and transparent? Well, as I said in my remarks, we have uh, stood up new processes and have found ways to uh, further digitize our systems, which admittedly uh, continue to be very paper-based in some lines of service. So, I think, uh, you know, the public service and my department in particular has really uh, risen to the occasion to find ways to move more into electronic uh, space so that we are uh, getting those applications turned around as quickly as possible. Uh, we have a business resumption plan to make sure that our people are back in offices, but like everybody else, we wanna be sure that we've got the right spacing and distancing to protect the health and safety of our public servants. And I think going forward, you know, this is a real opportunity. The pandemic has, allowed us to sort of uh, take a look at all of our operations and ask ourselves some fundamental questions. How can we modernize? How can we digitize? How can we be more efficient? And how can we do all of this in a way that is truly transparent? Because if we are going to have this conversation around increasing immigration and making sure that it is an economic driver, I think that has to go hand in glove with uh, having a, a, an operations and a system that is in place to support those fundamental objectives. And I know my department uh, is well aware that they've got a minister uh, who is going to advocate for those supports. And I think in the public as well, uh, we wanna make sure that we deliver. I'm committed to doing that and I'm looking forward uh, to, uh, to having those conversations going forward. Okay, thank you. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned increasing immigration and I'll ask everybody just to quickly comment on where you think we should go in terms of immigration. Currently we're at about 1% of the population uh, do you think we can we should be bringing in more immigration uh, just very quickly in indira absolutely um as we talked earlier and i think the minister touched on it a bit um, there's a recognition in terms of the government but also our society that we are if people are aging out there's a low birth rate we're just not going to have the workforce we will need to support our country and to support our families. So immigration is the answer and we have to embrace it and make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to bring that and put those supports in for, for the people that we will need to bring into our country. The other piece I just wanted to touch on, and I think Minister Medicino touched on it a bit, and, and so did Amarali, but the underutilization of the skills of these you know, impressive individuals it's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, that we faced over time and one of the biggest issues that we need to solve as we move forward over the next four years. And if we get that right, 
we will absolutely be moving to the front of the line in so many areas, in so many ways. But this is not the time to not use the skills of the people who are here. We need everyone, and we need everyone contributing. Denise, your thoughts about increasing immigration? I believe in the Century Initiative, 100,000 more, uh, 100,000 total uh, per it's year. It's per number year. And I won't repeat why I mentioned it earlier, but I want to come back to what Indira said. She is right on. The recognition of credentials uh, is extremely, extremely important, and people need to know how to do it, and there needs to be uh, incentive to encourage the different regulating bodies to ensure that they take that path. It does not make sense. I'll just give you an example. Pallet, a pallet that has been uh, piloting airplanes for Air France for 25 years will not be accepted to drive to fly planes here because there is no agreement with France. There is no agreement with countries in Europe. The only agreements are with countries in the state. Does that make sense? No. And this should be easy to solve. We need to talk to Transport Canada and convince them to uh, take more pilots from Europe as well. Uh, uh, Amir, and, I, and I'll just a introduce the issue, the, the numbers. Brian Mulroney recently talked about seven, uh, going up to a population of 75 million. The Century Initiative has talked about 100 million several years down the road. But what, uh, uh, Amir, your thoughts about increasing the level? Well, I tell you, the whole world views Canada as a country of opportunity, one of the top countries in the world to migrate to. I think Canada is the luxury of being able to pick and identify the best talent from around the world and the greatest potential that, that exists uh, in, in the globe. And I think we absolutely must take advantage of that. But I, I, I completely share the concern about when, when we sub-optimize on the credentialing process, the re-credentialing, if you will, we are really sub-optimizing the contributions that immigrants can make here in Canada. People come in with a lot of aspirations, a lot of talent, and they get discouraged very quickly when they when they they run across all the barriers that they can't seem to overcome. So completely support that uh, that line of thinking. Thank you. And Minister, what are your thoughts about about uh, Mr. Marooney's 75 million? He made that point when he was on our on our webinar uh, a week ago. Um, is the government thinking about putting one of using one of those large figures for down the road? Well, I'm certainly aware of uh, Mr. Mulroney's uh, stated objective, and I will say that in, in the general and certainly in the long term, I really think that the demographics make it uh, uh, a very uh, you know, obvious choice. How we do it, how we get there, what's the right mix, those are the types of uh, things that we need to be actively discussing and engaging with in particular in the midst of a pandemic, because we do need to be sure that we bring Canadians along with this discussion. And I think there are two principal themes that we're gonna to have to navigate. One is obviously the COVID era. And in an era where borders uh, restrictions remain in place, how are we sure that our process is in place to, to, to mitigate against the risk of the spread of the virus? Uh, and secondly, how do we uh, ensure that uh, the Canadian people are confident that immigration will be a net economic driver? Because at the end of the day, the demographic trends are well and long established. There is no way to turn this ship around on a dime. Um, we've got a, a retirement uh, rate that is faster than ever. Uh, we have a, a shrinking worker to retirement ratio that is currently at four to one. Uh, it's gonna be two to one in, in a very short period of time. And all of these, uh, stated objectives around upskilling and retooling and finding ways to modernize our workforce so that it's competitive with the rest of the world hinges on immigration. I believe that that is uh, going to be the touchstone or one of the touchstones of this exciting uh, discussion. Okay, uh, Minister, here's another specific question. What's the IRCC approach towards visitors who are already in Canada? Have you thought about programs to allow them temporarily, temporary employment without having to apply for the labor market impact assessment, for example, in essential jobs in agriculture where there is high demand? 
Well, first, let me say we've put into place a number of facilitative measures to help those who are here just visiting, again, not working. Let's per, put uh, those who are here to work uh, to the side for one moment, but those who are here just to visit to allow them uh, to minimize their disruption, to allow them to extend their stay, particularly because it is difficult to travel, especially by air if you've come from uh, overseas. And so we are providing supports to those who are here to visit. There are uh, you know, other supports that we put into place for those who are here on both open permits as well as closed permits because we recognize that COVID has caused disruptions in different sectors. I come back to the agricultural sector where if you are working on a farm and you lost your job because of COVID, uh, however unlikely that may be in the current circumstances, uh, we uh, put into place a policy that grants you implied status. We're also ensuring that um, we've been a little bit more flexible when it comes to restoring one's status uh, if your uh, work visa is expired. And I think it's innovations like that that are helping to allow us to take that all hands on deck approach that we need. We want a workforce that is uh, flexible, that is agile, that allows people to, uh, to, to apply their trades, their skills, in the parts of the economy that are still recovering. And we're gonna to continue to remain open to examining other options so that we are making the most of the temporary immigration that is here. And as Denise has pointed out, there are a number of ways in which uh, folks who are here studying and working do transition to permanent residence and residency. And I think that that is one of the real uh, areas of potential that we should be examining to tap into as we look at the big picture and how we try to leverage the skills and the experience that is already here in Canada to drive that economic recovery going forward. Okay, uh, two, two quick questions uh, and then we'll have to close up. Um, in terms of the IRB, there have been problems around some of the appointees. What steps are you taking to counter this social injustice? That's for, I assume that one's for me. That's for you. <laughs> Look, I, I've seen the report of some of the statements made by members and in the House of Commons, I've stood up and I've condemned them in, uh, in unequivocal terms. Um, I know that the IRB is undertaking a review of its training and we have provided additional support to the IRB to ensure that everyone gets a fair hearing that is free from any of the types of stereotypes, discrimination or biases that have no place in uh, the IRB or in frankly in any tribunal or any, in any aspect of life. And this is a government that believes in, in calling out racism in all of its forms, systemic uh, racism and dis discrimination in all of its forms. And as part of that, we need to be sure that the people that we appoint to these positions uh, hold those shared values so that uh, people get fair hearings. And that is work that I am very committed to doing as the minister. Okay, and last question for you, minister. Um, would the parents and grandparents application process open next January? Well, you know, we had a plan in place to relaunch after the um, after the election and we put a pause given COVID. All I'll say, Andrew, is um, we believe in family reunification. I talked about some of the exemptions at the border that we have created, even in the pandemic, to reunite families. Uh, I know that there is a, a real interest to see this program relaunched and my sincere hope is that we're going to actually have something sooner than before the end of the year. I don't want to fully commit to it today because we're still in a very fluid situation, but I know that uh, family reunification and parents and grandparents form part of the family unit and are not just there to provide emotional support. By extension, by being here, they actually provide economic support. And when we think about all of the families who are going to want to be getting back to work, um, you know, parents and grandparents are going to play a role as part of the child care support network that we need to be looking at. So this is gonna be an important program and I look forward to having to say more about that in the not too distant future. So uh, Minister, you mentioned earlier that, that, that you'll be making a, a series of announcement or announcement on, on immigration policy in the fall. Is that with your annual um, uh, levels announcement that you'll be making? I, I take it that's early November. Well, I remember uh, announcing my levels at the very beginning of March, just before we shut the borders. And of course, we're now in a, in a, in a different world, but we are going to be providing a fall update where we're going to be coming back to give um, everyone an update on where we are in 2020, but also to cast our eyes to the future. And this is where I feel optimistic and hopeful about charting the path forward, which critically, essentially involves immigration for all of the reasons that we've discussed and for all the reasons that my esteemed co-panelists have outlined, um, 
there is a, a very strong record where we tie immigration to economic growth and social cohesion. And that is precisely the, the case that I am so excited to be making to the Canadian public as we move forward to accelerate our recovery and to chart out that long-term prosperity, uh, which immigration has been tied to inexorably uh, since uh, the very earliest days of this country. Okay, I think that that we're out of time. That wraps up our, our, our discussion very well, unless Minister, you had any last quick thought to add to that. I think you, you got it's been wonderful to be with you all and good to see uh, everybody on the panel. And I want to thank you, Andrew, for facilitating the discussion uh, and for all the uh, participants. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est un grand plaisir. And uh, I look forward to more, uh, more, just more in the uh, in the future. Okay, well, thank you, Indira Naidu Harris, Denise Amio, Amir Ali Kasim Lakha, and Minister Marco Mendicino. There's a lot of people who've been watching us today who've sent in questions. Since you can't hear them applause, I'm going to ask you to clap for each other as we go out. So thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Stay safe. Merci. Merci, Denise.